Today, the marble used to reconstruct the Parthenon is cut by a handful of workers using heavy equipment. Do it the old fashioned way. Really to show an appreciation. The latest technology is used to cut the marble. Specialists drill holes several meters into the rock. Long steel cables set with diamond chips are threaded through the rock like a giant bandsaw to cut blocks weighing several tons. But the ancient methods of getting marble for buildings such as the Parthenon have not been lost either. The stone is still split the same way as it was 2,000 years ago, with heavy hammers, iron chisels, and a deep knowledge of the structure of marble. The gigantic blocks had to be transported many kilometers to the Acropolis. Carts, pulled by several teams of oxen, hauled the huge loads. And while in the city, splendid monuments were being erected to the glory of democracy, in the quarries, those at the bottom of society were slaving under the most inhumane conditions. Slavery was certainly a fact of daily life, and it's, I think, more a question of manpower than anything. But when we look at the records for the buildings on the Acropolis, we find that free Athenians, Greeks from other city-states, and slaves all worked on the building together, all doing exactly the same jobs, and all being paid a daily wage. Uh, and the, the lot of a slave varied tremendously. At the bottom end of the scale, they worked in the silver mines, and their lives must have been very hard and very short. Uh, there were slaves who were public servants, like accountants, uh, whose lives were not too bad. And some slaves even ran some of the major banks in Athens. Slavery was taken completely for granted, even in the enlightened democracy of Athens. While Athenian citizens were primarily concerned with politics, slaves guaranteed the commercial success of the city. Many slaves were well-trained artisans. Their work is the model for today's stonemasons on the Acropolis. New pieces for the Parthenon are chiseled from the blocks with utmost precision. When the chisels become blunt, the blacksmith provides new sharp tools. Like Hephaestus, the god of fire and forge, he has mastered the interplay of fire and water to produce hard steel. finest tools for the best stonemasons in Greece. In the residential quarter around the Agora, buildings were constructed with much less care. Houses were small and cramped. Even though their inhabitants were not the rich of Athens, here too, Archaeologists are uncovering shards of elaborately painted bowls and vessels. When restored, they provide an impressive image of Greek daily life. the aristocratic style of living. There were plenty of aristocrats and rich people, even in democratic Athens. Uh, there are some pots that show sort of normal activities in shops and fishmongers cutting up fish and butchers and people working in workshops. But generally, the art is, is sponsored by the aristocracy, and they're going to be interested in feasting and hunting and partying and the things that aristocrats like to do. Athenian democracy had deprived the aristocracy of power. 
every citizen had equal rights, but not all citizens were equal. Many old aristocratic families harked back to a long tradition of privilege and still had considerable wealth and influence, even in the democracy. They were the ones who could afford these costly amphoras. The best vase painters were famous throughout Greece, and their work fetched high prices. Dimitris Tathopoulos carries on the art of the ancient masters with great passion. Βεβαίως, αυτά ξεδιπλωθήκανε σιγά σιγά σε μένα, ναι, για τον εξή λόγο. Έτσι πιστεύω, διότι το ερετεύτηκα το αντικείμενο και υπήρξε ένα αληθινό έρο. Και αφού υπήρξε αληθινό έρο μεταξύ εμένα και του Αγίου, μου απεκαλύφθη. Όταν κατάλαβε ότι πραγματικά το αγαπώ, μου απεκαλύφθη και μου άνοιξε την ψυχή του και μου το έδωσε στα χέρια. The secret lies in the paint. Liquid clay is used to paint the vases before firing. Only after they've been fired in the kiln do the vases acquire their characteristic color. But it isn't just the artistic or technical aspects of the painter's work that matter to him. What am I capious? Από ένα ποτήρι νερό δεν χρησιμοποιούνται καν το 50% από τον επόμενο. Hi, my name's Jack. Uh, I'm a second year therapeutic radiography student at Sheffield Hallam University. On placement, uh, what I do is I support the radiographers in their day-to-day -day job. The most prominent piece of technology that we use is the linear accelerator that we use to um, deliver high-power x-rays. Um, to a patient's treatment site, and we do that in order to deliver radi ionizing radiation to that location and hopefully kill off those cancerous cells. At Sheffield Hallam, uh, they prepare you really well for placement. For the radiotherapy and oncology course, uh, we get to use industry leading planning software like Eclipse. We have a lot of physical resources as well, and we get to do simulated placements on that, which is essentially where you can do mock patient setups. Uh, we get actors in on the bed or we use dummies on the bed and we use our, our lasers in the room uh, to set up the treatment couch that we have and it's really good at preparing you for going out on placement. If you want a career in a forever evolving patient focused environment, um, radiotherapy is definitely, definitely the career for you. It's not every job you get to come away from work thinking that you've really made a difference or having really made a difference and it's not every job that you get to come away from work knowing that you've helped cure cancer. νευρικό σύστημα που έχει στα χείλη του. Όταν πάει και πιει κάτω από τη βρύση και τρέχει το νερό έχει μια άλλη αίσθηση γιατί βρέχει όλα τα χείλη και ενεργοποιείται ολόκληρο το νευρικό σύστημα που έχουμε στα χείλη μας. Όταν θα πει κάποιος από μια κύλικα φτάνει το υγρό μέχρι την άκρη των χειλιών του και έχει μια τελείως διαφορετική αίσθηση. Τα συμπόζια της Αθήνης και της Αθήνης In those days, symposium meant simply drinking session. Rich Athenians attended lavish feasts with music and dancing. The symposia hosted by Freeney were legendary. Her guests were philosophers, artists and politicians. This evening, Praxiteles is the center of attention. He has announced that he will soon unveil his statue of Aphrodite. The guests buy at telling tales, while drinking games and riddles amuse the men and their courtesans. of the evening, the drinking bowls reveal their secret. Με τους κυματισμούς που μπορεί να κάνει μέσα το νερό ή το κρασί που έχει, η ζωγραφική που υπάρχει μέσα είτε αναφέρεται σε θεούς, είτε αναφέρεται σε ερωτικές πράξεις, είτε αναφέρεται σε αθλητισμό και τα λοιπά, κινείται 
και έχει μια αίσθηση επαφής με το Θεό ή με οποιαδήποτε παράσταση έχει μέσα. Συν τις άλλες, αυτές οι μεγάλες κήλικες μπορούσε κανείς να πει σχεδόν ξαπλωμένος γιατί αυτοί συνήθως καθόντουσαν επάνω σε ανάγκλητρα τα οποία ήσουν μισοξαπλωμένος και πήγανε κατά αυτόν τον τρόπο. Ενώ ο Ινοχώος έβαζε το κρασί όπως αυτός ήταν ξαπλωμένος έπινε. But this evening, Fweeney's symposium is disrupted. Praxiteles' slave would not normally be allowed to intrude, but the news he has rushed through the dark streets to tell is too appalling. <laughs> Vrini has a premonition of the catastrophe. fears are confirmed. Intruders have broken in and smashed Praxiteles' work, thus revealing Freeney's secret. city knows that Trini intended to create the image of a goddess in her own likeness. No mortal has ever dared do this. between the worlds of the gods and of mortals. To ensure the continued benevolence of the gods on Mount Olympus, the Athenians established holy places throughout their realm. They honored more than their patron, Athene. The temple at Cape Sunion was dedicated to Poseidon, the god of the sea who protected shipping and trade with the colonies. Athens had established commercial links from Sicily to the Black Sea. There were even Greek settlements in Egypt. But the gods were known to be capricious. It was better not to rely only on them. To safeguard their influence and repel enemies, Athens maintained an enormous navy. Pride of the fleet were the triremes, war galleys with three banks of oars, which were able to protect the heavily loaded cargo ships. In the harbor at Piraeus, 200 of these ships were waiting to be deployed. One of the civic duties of Athenians was to crew these dreaded warships. Fully mobilized, the Athenian fleet required 40,000 oarsmen. While the rich could pay for the upkeep of the fleet and send their slaves to sea, the poor had no choice but to do the rowing themselves. Every trireme was manned by 170 oarsmen. They were often crammed together for days on end and the heat below deck must have been dreadful. 
At the beginning of the 5th century BC, the great strategist Themistocles convinced the Athenians to invest a large proportion of their national assets in the fleet, thus turning the city-state into a sea power. For a few decades, Athens dominated the eastern Mediterranean and the numerous Greek city-states. But soon, the old conflicts broke out again, and Greece became embroiled in seemingly endless wars once more. Warfare was virtually a, a yearly occurrence, uh, and these are citizen armies, so that virtually everybody must have fought quite frequently. They were all eligible for military duty from age 18 to 59. They had large land armies, and they had those huge fleets that required tens of thousands of rowers. So I think most Athenians experience war uh, several times in the course of their lives. It's, it's done seasonally, that is to say, if you're a farmer, you're going to tend your fields first and then go fight your neighbor when you're not trying to get in your crop. But uh, it was a, a part of daily life, no question. The theater provided distraction from daily cares. Under the guardianship of Mary Dionysus, the god of wine, playwrights pilloried, often coarsely, the abuses prevalent in their society. Dignitaries and politicians in their seats of honor were often the targets of this public mockery. Theater was a democratic institution to which every Athenian had access. There was room for more than 17,000 spectators in the steeply tiered seating. Political decisions were made on the Pnyx, the place of the people's assembly, an inconspicuous open space within sight of the Acropolis. Here, the first parliament in history assembled. The most famous orators of antiquity stood on these steps and addressed the citizens of Athens. Voting by show of hands took place on the Pnyx, the birthplace of democracy. Athenians lived in an information society. Every citizen was obliged to learn to read and write. During the excavations at the Agora alone, thousands of inscriptions on stone were uncovered. Public appeals, information for citizens, or funerary inscriptions like this stela. democracy, such as the Athenian one, virtually the entire government would change every year, except for a handful of officials. And that means you need very, very good record keeping because not all the projects are going to stop in a year and somebody has to keep track of the money. So you have to say how much money you got when you became the grain commissioner, how you spent that money, and how much money you, you passed on the following year to the next grain commissioner. So essentially, uh, you have to have excellent record keeping uh, because of this constant changing of the officials. The Greek script has not changed in more than 2,000 years. This stela was erected in memory of a young woman whose name is immortalized here beside her husband's. No other culture has left behind so much written evidence as Athens. So we know that Phryne did actually live. However, whether the details of her story are truth or fiction is still in doubt. The court of Athens is in session. Phryne appears, flanked by her lawyer, Hippolytus, 
and is met by her accuser. Not even her influential patrons have been able to prevent the legal proceedings. Opinion in the city has turned against the famous courtesan. If the jury finds her guilty, she faces the threat of banishment, slavery, or even death. But Freeney knows what she is doing. To everyone's surprise, Iparidis does not dispute the charge against Freeney. How so? Then she herself provides the proof that her beauty is worthy of a goddess. If ever there was a mortal woman who might lend her body to Aphrodite, it is free. The independent judicial system was one of the greatest achievements of Athenian democracy. Citizens had no obligation to any ruler or god, only to themselves. A demonstration of this is the propylia, which is also being restored. For 2,500 years, the propylia has been the gateway to the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Like the Parthenon, the Propylia is being renovated in a historically accurate way. To this end, every stone is being removed, cleaned of old mortar, and restored. The architect Tassos Tanulas is overseeing the work, first planned over 30 years ago. His interests extend beyond architecture. For him, the Propylia is a symbol of Athenian democracy. What appears to be a temple is not dedicated to any god. Rather, it is a place of leisure for the citizens of Athens. The Propylaea is uh, par excellence a secular building. I mean, and it, this is a new idea in uh, uh, the uh, ancient Greek architecture. Uh, this is a building which was meant for the people. It had uh, benches all around, uh, along, all along the walls of the porches and the central building, and also uh, the rooms of the um, uh, wings which uh, were never built, or the pinakotheki, which still is a room. They were meant for sacrificial meals, so they were for the people to be, to enter them and to enjoy their architecture and luxury. So there was a temple's luxury in a secular building. For the first time in history, a splendid building such as the Propylia was not erected for gods or kings, but by citizens for the citizens of a free city. It is a symbol of the self-confidence and pride of democratic Athens. Praxiteles 
Hercules can now complete the statue to praise and honor Aphrodite. The historian Pausanias reports that the goddess was flattered by Phrynes' beauty and the gods were reconciled with Athens. Though the original is lost, the statue is thought to be the first significant nude of a woman ever sculpted. The rise of Athens to a leading position among Greek cities was due to democracy, which led to an unparalleled blossoming of the arts and sciences in the 4th and 5th centuries BC. The power of Athens extended far beyond Greece and throughout the Mediterranean. But even in ancient times, the influence of the metropolis began to wane. Other cities took over its leading role, cities such as Alexandria, Carthage, and Rome. But none of those could dispute the place of Athens in history. This was the cradle of democracy. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, these cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities, seeking prosperity and happiness. The entrance to the harbour of one of antiquity's mega cities, Alexandria. It was founded in 331 BC by Alexander the Great. The Greek commander had just conquered Egypt and wanted to establish a new royal city in his own honour on the western edge of the Nile Delta. His architects designed the city on a grid pattern to be built on unoccupied ground. For decades, Alexandria was the largest construction site of the ancient Mediterranean. It attracted people from everywhere, among them the most important thinkers of the time. Alexandria became the cultural center of the ancient world. Today, over four million people live in Egypt's second largest city. The modern metropolis has buried ancient Alexandria under concrete and asphalt. Only deep beneath the city, and in the expanses of the Egyptian desert, can evidence of Alexandria's mysterious past be found. What knowledge was stored in the legendary library of Alexandria? Where stood the famous lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world? What drew people to Alexandria from around the world? One of these stories has come down to us, the story of Agnodiki, who came from Athens to the young metropolis to seek her fortune.
The stellar rise of Alexandria has preoccupied the French archaeologist Jean-Yves Pompeur for over ten years. He's the director of the Centre for Alexandrian Studies. His research reveals that the ancient metropolis was a city of gigantic dimensions. The streets are wider than in any other city. The, the Via Canopica, the Canopic Way, was more than 30 meters wide. And so it's incredible size for the, uh, if you compare with the ancient cities like Athens or Corinth. It's, uh, it's like New York compared to Paris or London, you know? And even uh, they had the skyscraper, like the lighthouse. Uh, so the Greek who came from the old trees from the islands were very much impressed when they came to the city. The lighthouse, with its gleaming white marble facade, rose 140 meters into the sky. It was a conspicuous landmark and a symbol of Alexandria's power. Construction of the lighthouse began in 299 BC, based on plans by Sostratus of Cnidos. After 20 years of construction, the gigantic tower was finally nearing completion. It was a symbol of hope for all those making the perilous voyage to Alexandria. It was a beacon for Agnadiki too, whose story is told by the Roman scholar Hyginius. Nothing remains of the lighthouse today. Not even its location is certain. However, there are many indications that this is where it stood. Today, the harbour entrance is dominated by a building from the 15th century, Fort Cape Bay. Renovations on this Arab citadel have recently begun. They offer a rare opportunity to uncover the building's secrets. Did the ruins of the lighthouse provide materials to build the fort? Ein deutscher Ingenieur hat Anfang des 20. Jahrhunderts eine groß angelegte Untersuchung über die Zitadelle gemacht und er behauptet aufgrund Studien von den arabischen Autoren, dass sich der Pharosstumpf immer noch in der Zitadelle selber in dem Hauptturm befindet. Dies kann aber nur durch Grabung untersucht werden und wir sind jetzt dabei, rund um den Turm herum an verschiedenen Stellen Sondagen zu machen. Das heißt, in kleinen Fenstern runter zu gucken auf den Fels, um zu sehen, ob wir irgendwo die Abmessungen für die Fundamente finden, irgendwelche Spuren, die auf den Leuchtturm hinweisen. Katrin Machinek is an architect on Dr. Ampreur's team. Under the fort is a huge system which could supply enough water to last out a lengthy siege. The system is like a museum of architectural history. There are Corinthian capitals and ancient columns. Do they include fragments of the lighthouse? The site of Cape is a, a mixed site of uh, um, architectural pieces belonging to the lighthouse itself. We could, for instance, reconstruct a very huge door, more than 12, or up to 30 meters from the lintel uh, to, to the soil, with very night jams and lintel of granite from Aswan. Uh, we have some colossal statues uh, which stood on, in this place because we have formed them parallels 
one to the other uh, just in front of their bases. So there are very uh, big statues of the uh, kings, Ptolemies, and their queens, which were standing during antiquity at the foot of the lighthouse. Most likely, Fort Kate Bay stands on the spot once occupied by the mightiest lighthouse of all time. It guided mariners safely into Alexandria's harbor for 1,500 years until it was toppled by an earthquake. What has remained is its legend. The best builders of the times were brought to Alexandria to create this architectural miracle. Among them was Kratis, brother of Agnadike's mother. As a young engineer, he had taken up Alexander the Great's call and followed him here. Agnodike has arrived from Athens. Having survived an arduous and dangerous sea voyage. Agnodike has a bold plan, which she can realize only in Alexandria. first traces of the city of Alexandria are found out at sea on a small rocky island off the coast, Nelson Island. Professor Paolo Gallo, after years of negotiation, is the first scientist allowed to explore this barren island in a secure military zone. Here, he expects to unearth important information on the origins of Alexandria. His early findings seem to justify his hopes. The most striking feature of what we found, it is that we found the only uh, levels which are intact belonging to... ...to this period. I mean, in Alexandria itself, it is very difficult to find uh, periods of the first Ptolemaic um, age uh, in which all the things are still in situ. So there we found all the pottery and all the things that were abandoned at once. Much to Gallo's surprise, this outpost was abandoned shortly after Alexandria's founding and has remained uninhabited ever since. Just below ground level, the foundations of a large building have emerged. Was this a temple, a lighthouse, or a military installation? On the steep cliffs along the shore, the archaeologists stumbled across the entrance to an underground gallery, part of an ancient system. In the 17th century, English sailors sought shelter here. Here is written, Helen Lux, 1658, and this is his portrait. So a man of this period, with the barbiche and the moustache. Two thousand years earlier, Alexander the Great's soldiers made camp on the island. We discovered houses belonging to soldiers of this period. Uh, and for sure there was a military garrison there. We found big bowls of catapults in the houses. The island was strategically positioned facing Canopus, Egypt's most important Mediterranean port until the founding of Alexandria. From this island, Alexander the Great could control the Egyptian harbor and also speed up construction of his royal city. This military garrison uh, was occupied only during a short period, during, during about, uh, about almost between 30 and 40 
years, no more. So after this was completely abandoned. So we can understand from this that was abandoned because the strategical interest of the islet and of Canopus itself and the harbor of Canopus uh, was lost because the new harbor, that of Alexandria, was uh, already working. Was the island perhaps also a kind of planning office for the city going up on the mainland? Alexandria was an experimental city. Newer excavations show the complexity of the work undertaken by ancient engineers. By now, archaeologists from Dr. Empereur's team have become specialists in rescue digs on construction sites. Each time a point of entry to ancient Alexandria is uncovered, a race against time begins for the archaeologists. Many promising sites are rapidly covered over again by the building contractors. For them, Every day of archaeological excavation represents a financial loss. De façon générale, dans la ville d'Alexandrie, pour atteindre les niveaux hellénistiques, il faut une puissance stratigraphique de 12 mètres. Pour atteindre ce niveau-là, il faut passer à travers des couches, des couches de l'époque médiévale, de l'époque musulmane, ensuite de l'époque romaine, pour arriver aux couches de l'époque hellénistique et nous nous devons fouiller toutes ces couches là jusqu'au terrain naturel. This area near the ancient palace has been inhabited continuously since the founding of the city, but it is difficult to interpret the sequence of historical eras. Still, discoveries have been made here that show how far sighted Greek city planners were. Cisterns and water pipes have been found. They show the progressive way Alexandrian engineers solved the problem of a city that lacked spring water. The first thing the Greeks laid down for the new metropolis was a network of prefabricated clay pipes for the water supply. As in modern water systems, the mass produced ancient pipes with their cone shaped ends fitted exactly into one another. Tens of thousands of such pipes must have been laid below ground before work began on the roads. The entire infrastructure, the layout of roads and paths and the position of buildings must have been determined in detail from the start. A masterpiece of planning. Water from the Nile and from natural reservoirs near the city flowed through canals to the city's ingenious network of water pipes. Two hundred kilometers inland is the region of Fayum, which in antiquity was the granary for the city of Alexandria. In this fertile region, time seems to have stood still. To this day, the ancient form of irrigation, as simple as it is ingenious, has been preserved. Powered by the water itself, the wheel raises the precious liquid in its scoops and empties it into canals. When the water reached Alexandria, it had to be stored and distributed. An underground system 
Isabel Ivory from the Center for Alexandrian Studies has been researching the hidden water reservoirs of the city for years. The El Nabi system is the best preserved. It dates from the time of Arab rule in Alexandria. Ces matériaux proviennent de la surface de bâtiments qui ont été démontés, déconstruits, et qui, à l'époque où ces citernes ont été construites, étaient certainement abandonnés. Donc, nous raconte également l'histoire de la ville aux différentes époques qui ont précédé la période arabe. When the Arabs reached the city during the 8th century AD, they built huge water systems. A thousand years earlier, the Greeks had solved the problem of water supply in a different but no less spectacular manner. Donc, il y a un réseau dynamique formé de canaux creusés dans la roche profondément. Ces canaux partaient du canal d'Alexandrie qui venait prendre la qui se connectait avec la branche canopique du Nil et apportait l'eau jusque au port d'Alexandrie. Et de ce canal partaient certainement des canaux à ciel ouvert ou peut-être des aqueducs et amenaient de l'eau dans le réseau souterrain qui ressortait par le biais de puits à l'intérieur même des maisons. Only a few years after the city's founding in 331 BC the population of Alexandria had increased to half a million. But its architects had anticipated the growth of the settlement and had designed a road system built on a grid which could handle a high volume of traffic. The two main traffic arteries of modern Alexandria date back to when the city was founded. They're the same size they were over 2,000 years ago. Magnificent palaces and temples lined the avenues in those days. But how did ordinary Alexandrians live? Grzegorz Majerik from Warsaw University has managed to excavate the remains of residential buildings from the city's beginnings. Each uh, owner was assigned the same, was allotted the same uh, lot of land, roughly 25 by 25 meters, to build his house on it. And we think that this system that, backs, uh, uh, that goes back to the time of Alexander the Great was retained at least for four centuries in Alexandria. A well-to-do family lived on about 600 square meters of land. Enough for a spacious villa surrounded by gardens and stables. Discoveries such as this house with its Greek mosaic are rare, but everyday items from Alexandria are even rarer. Alexandria's Greco Roman Museum houses the few remaining artifacts from that time, including the precious Tanagra figurines. They were always found in the graves of young women, for whom the figurines were probably companion, toy, and lucky charm. Ancient Alexandria was not only the... the most modern city of its time but also the center of knowledge only here can Agnodiki fulfill her greatest wish to study medicine and become a doctor even in Alexandria this was unthinkable for a woman a taboo Agnodiki must break if she wants to achieve her goal In cosmopolitan Alexandria, the image of women was shaped by Greek ideals.
The proof is in the details of the Tanagraph figurines. The elaborate painting has survived the centuries. The figurines show Alexandrian women followed Greek fashion in their clothes and hair. But did they follow Greek conventions in other respects as well? In Alexandria, the Greeks had encountered a pharaonic tradition. Whereas in Greece, a woman's life was intended to be passed within the confines of the home, Egypt boasted some powerful female rulers. You could find all the races of the people of the world. All the languages were spoken in Alexandria. And even in the library, you could find papyri books, between brackets, Within, uh, written in any ling language of the world and translated from Egyptian to Greek, from uh, Aramean, Hebrew uh, to Greek and so on. So it's, it was uh, the melting pot of uh, antiquity. Like every big city, Alexandria was from the outset a major center of production. One effect of living so closely together was the division of labor and specialization. People sold their goods and bought their food on the street. The only meal that ordinary people usually had at home was the evening meal. Breakfast was generally okay. bread dipped in wine. The century, still the same thing. Where fishermen bring their catch to shore today, the slaves of 2,300 years ago unloaded the merchant ships. Goods from all over the Mediterranean were loaded and unloaded here. Alexandria Harbour was Egypt's gate to the world. At the beginning of the 19th century, ancient Alexandria had been almost completely forgotten. Then by pure chance, the driver of a cab made an astonishing discovery. It brought to light the history hidden beneath the city and gave a fascinating insight into this Greek settlement in Egypt. Early one morning, he hitched up his horse and went to work on the streets of Alexandria. In one of the narrow lanes, the road suddenly gave way beneath him and revealed the entrance to a long forgotten world. city of the dead, the catacombs of Qom el Shakafa. Twenty meters beneath the bustle of the modern port city lies an extensive network of caves carved out of the rock. Here, the people of Alexandria buried their dead. This sarcophagus is decorated with Greek vine leaves and with Egyptian gods. It expresses the peaceful coexistence between the newly arrived Greek settlers and the indigenous Egyptians. This coexistence was fostered by General Ptolemy, who assumed power here after the death of Alexander the Great. His heirs continued this policy. And thus, Ptolemaic culture came into being, cosmopolitan and dedicated to progress. Alexandria became a center of knowledge. This is why Agnodike II has come to Alexandria. But because official avenues are closed to her, she's resorting to a dangerous ruse. She must become a man. Her uncle Kratis tries to change her mind, but she will not be deterred by his warnings. Oh, 
Die Apokairis und den Kriechers. Die Apokairis und dann des Kriechers. Agnodike is bold, but she is also keenly aware of the danger she must face if she is to enter the world of knowledge to which only men have access. Toxic bastards. Knowledge is power. That was the insight of the Ptolemaic rulers. Their legacy was some splendid monuments. For Dr. Empereur, the Temple of Taposiris is an impressive example of the magnificent buildings that must once have graced Alexandria. That's all I've got done in an hour. Taposiris is in the westernmost part of Alexandria. It indicates the size of the area ruled by the Ptolemies. Region was a flourishing commercial district with a harbor, warehouses, vineyards, and small workshops. The position of this uh, temple is strategic because we are here at the end of the territory of Alexandria. There was a wall, what they call the Arab Wall, here to prevent any people to enter this area without paying the customs. So they had to go through a gate there on the lake. And even all the ships sailing on this lake had to go through a small bridge and to pay also the customs to enter Alexandria territory. This area was heavily populated. The temple was surrounded by its own town with its own infrastructure. Next to the temple district were extensive residential areas and artisans' workshops producing goods of all kinds. To this day, the shards of hundreds of thousands of amphorae still lie here. So this is only a very small part of the big dam, and uh, you can see uh, there are some uh, bottom of amphoras, and it's uh, pointed to stand in the sand, to stand in the kiln, to stand in the ships where they were transported to uh, exportation. This is uh, a handle, double handle, you see, a very strong one, with a figure print of the pottery maker, you can see it when he did it. So, uh, thousands of pamphras made by many, many people who participated to this production, mass production for mass exportation to Alexandria and to the rest of the Mediterranean. In ancient times, mass production probably looked much like this. In a remote inland river valley, thousands of amphorae are still produced today. The process has not changed. People still get their clay from the river. 